Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MCC. I'm absolutely honoured and delighted to introduce to you our guest today, Father William Costco, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Father Costco, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Zahi. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, Pleasure to be in Australia. My first time. <laughs> well, I just learned something before we get into it, which is I'm quite fascinated about. So you have something that I don't actually own or have. You have a didgeridoo. Yes, I I. I do have a didgeridoo. <laughs> <laughs> all you, all you guys had one. I'm not good at it. <laughs> Where, how did you, no, we don't, we don't all. I don't do it, man, and I don't think, maybe you guys do. So how, can you please tell the story, how did you end up attending one? I, I, w I was at some, uh, festival and somebody was uh, selling them and uh, I tried one out. I, I liked the vibration that it gave my lungs and stuff. It just felt kind of cool. And uh, all priests, I believe, need a uh, anger management. Oh. And so you find something that just helps you let it out. Uh, for me, it used to be motorcycles. Uh, I've now switched to music. I play guitar, electric guitar, very loud, and the didgeridoo. And it really helps you, you know. You just let a little music out, go back to work. <laughs> Better than yelling at somebody. And look, your uh, video, your homily that was posted back in February about pro-abortion Catholics, it's, uh, it's gone viral. Um, it, it got my attention, you know, and a friend of mine, even in India, actually sent it to me. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's done the rounds around the world. Um, Which was honestly. weird because, to be honest with you, I don't think you'll find... I, I've never allowed myself to be recorded at mass, which is strange because my first degree in college prior to entering seminary is in communication arts, filmmaking. Right. I, and I, I, I studied in Los Angeles at Loyola University, a Jesuit institution. Won't get into that. But, uh, and then I worked in uh, Hollywood for a couple of years. And now years later, I'm a priest and I really am kind of gun shy about uh, media technology especially with regard to the mass. I just sort of feel like, look, I'm here for you people here. If I got in, like I didn't live stream during the whole bat virus, coronavirus meltdown thing. I just said, no, I'm here for my people. The other thing is, is when they go out online, you can't stop it then. And then people don't know you and they say, oh, that guy's being really, you know, cocky or whatever. And it's like, no, you got to understand me. I've been here for 15 years at this parish. My people know my jokes. If you think I'm just an angry guy, they would say, no, that was the only time we ever really heard him, you know, fire off like that. And so I just don't like putting it out there. But the day before I gave that homily, I do do videos and stuff and little skits and stuff. I don't mind that. But just the mass to me needs to be protected, I think. Yes. And that's just my thing. So I told this guy who I do these little skits with, I said, would you film this for my protection? I think I'm going to say a few things because this was two weeks after President okay. Joe Biden was inaugurated. And I said, I think I need to say a few things to the people, but I don't record my, I don't write my homilies normally, mm. barely use notes. Yeah. I said, I could accidentally say something that would be misunderstood. So would you please film it? And people saw him filming and they started asking me, are you going to put that online? And I was like, mm, not really. But then one guy came up to me after mass with just tears in his eye, big guy, Mexican American guy. And he just hugged me so hard I couldn't breathe. And then he just said, I was like, he just, he, he was just crying. He just goes, thank you. I've been waiting so long to hear that. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. And then this other lady, please, please. I want to send that to my sister. And I said, okay, 10 people will want to watch it. It's 30 minutes long. I said, I haven't watched it. <laughs> so I told this guy, go ahead and put it online. Nobody will watch it. And and then all of a sudden, I'm like, what? Anyway, it filled a, filled a vacuum. Yeah. Same no, thing I, that happened with Father Altman last May. I mean, yeah. he said something that filled the vacuum that all us, well, not all, a lot of us priests were thinking, like, what are we doing? What's our part? I'm not a doctor or scientist. That ain't my job. Mm. And he filled that vacuum. And maybe I did, too, for some people. I think you uh, certainly weird. did. I mean, it touched my heart. Um, I remember when Joe Biden got inaugurated. I mean, we're in Australia. It's not like we have much to do with the American election, but it does mm -hmm. obviously affect the world in terms of how, you know, influence uh, goes around. But I remember 
there was a group that I'd, I'd actually supported and there were like a Iraqi Catholic, you know, Christian community that was, you know, raising funds. And they were, the, the head of that group was celebrating Joe Biden being inaugurated. And I went, hang on a minute. So I, I couldn't help myself. I just posted a long thing about, do you guys actually realize who you're celebrating? This guy's pro-abortion, blah, blah, blah. And I went into details. Mm -hmm. And I was just speaking out against it. And I think I had over 200 people like and comment on my comment. You know, other Catholics that were also really upset about these guys uh, celebrating. The Catholic response, I think what really, you know, like irked us was as Catholics, not as our as political, like if we're exactly. conservative or whatever you call us. Uh, because if he were not Catholic, mm. I, I would not have given that homily. I didn't do that with Barack Obama or if I had been a priest when Bill Clinton was president. I know I seem to be naming Democrats, but because their party platform calls for abortion on demand, paid yeah. for by taxes. So it's not picking on them. But I don't think I'd have come off like that. Mm. What hits us is he's a member of the family. Yes. It's kind of like in the mafia, if you speak against the family, you get whacked. Okay. Yeah. So for us, it's like, and here's what the, the, the amount of response. In fact, I'm still writing letters and answering emails thousands from well just all over it's insane and it's been a real change in my priesthood but the number of non-catholics who have written to me and among that number saying we're so glad the catholic church is on board with the pro-life movement and i say well yeah but what do you mean on board on board yeah the That's... church spearheads the movement but obviously the perception is because of perhaps politicians, famous people, maybe even clergy who speak against our beliefs, mm. their perception is that we're not pro-life. Mm. That's pathetic. And I said, and I think that's what irked us and for me too. And so I just wanted to lay it out. I got 5,000 people at my parish and I just said, I'm gonna make it real clear to you where this parish stands. Mm. And I don't think anybody left, but I just wanted to let them know this is where I'm leading you guys. Yeah. Now, if you take it that I told you that you're bad because you voted for Joe Biden, I'm just saying, no, but I do think we need to, uh, we should have thought about that. Your faith is before your politics. Correct. You probably, I would say, it's better to walk away. And if you thought Trump was Satan incarnate, fine. All right. If that's what you believe, but you then don't go off and vote, particularly as a Catholic, for someone who doesn't represent us on about five monstrous issues. Mm. And so far, it does not look good. There's mm. not been a thing he's done that hasn't been what we thought he would do. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. we're only five months into this. If anything, he is, I think I read on LifeSite News that he is worse than Obama in terms of pushing the uh, pro-abortion. Well, he didn't wait two hours. Yeah. And, uh, and even to talk about things like we need to codify Roe v. Wade, which is the dis Supreme Court decision from 1973, mm. when... Uh, People say it made abortion legal. It's not quite that way. It's not a codified law. Mm. But now they're talking about we need to federally codify it. And that would mean like a state, like you have, you call them provinces? Or do you call them states? Like no, states here. State. States. I mean, a state can still say, okay, fine, abortion's legal, but we limit it. If, it's, uh, if you're under the age of 18, you have to have parent permission. Yes. And we're still, well, the federal codification would be, no, the federal government will tell you, Okay. You wow. must do what we say. And to even venture that idea is scary. That's appalling. So so it's not good. And then obviously, what what does that say about the Catholic Church? That this is this is the product. Hmm. I mean, isn't it the biggest position in the world? I mean, you Australians, you'll disagree, but you'll but well, people say the president of the United States, most powerful man in the world. Yeah. And he's a Catholic. And we're like, how, how did it get to that point? Why didn't we come up with a, a Catholic who is a moral Catholic guy who leads our nation? Mm. And you look back and say, because that's what we're producing. We're producing this kind of product. It's not, a, it's not our best product. Mm. And the it's embarrassing in that sense. Absolutely. I mean, the most disturbing part for me, and I think a lot of people I know within my community, is the fact that, you know, this is, 
there's resistance and people like Father Altman, probably yourself, are getting heat for being Catholic and speaking out against this. That, that just boggles my mind because growing up in Australia, when you tell people you're Catholic, I mean, the perception is, oh, you're, you know, uh, you don't support sex before marriage, abortion, all the, all the things that uh, go, synonym, go hand in hand with being Catholic. But here we are in 2021 and we're talking, people have to speak out against this. It, it, for me, it's still... It's I, I got a call to... from a, a, a Nigerian seminarian who's studying in the United States. Yeah. And he said, he saw my video and he said, I cried all night. And I don't understand in my country, if I tell people something is bad, they say, thank you, you tell us what is bad. But I come to America now and I feel that in your country, which he's probably going to be a priest for a diocese in the US. Yeah. He says, so I'm going to say things and people are going to say, oh, that's your opinion. Yeah. He says, what is it with your American culture? <laughs> you know, in my country, they would say, okay, you say it's bad. We stay away from bad. Like a parent saying, don't touch the scorpion. Hmm. And he just, I said, I know it's a cultural shock. You're going to get people saying, thank you, Father, for your opinion, but uh, keep it to yourself. So it's, it's we're in a weird we're in a weird zone right now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the same out here. It's yeah, absolutely same out here. But I love what you said in the homily. I mean, the example it really touched my heart about being on that bus, and yes. and uh, and seeing that uh, I, I I think so many people connected with that. I related to that personally when because I was actually on a bus once, and there were two people, and I was only a kid, 15, 16 years old, and there were two people having a fight. And I got home and I told my father about that. And he said, why didn't you get out of the bus and do something about it? Mm -hmm. And the bus, I said, well, the bus was moving, dad. Uh, I couldn't run out of the bus. He said, as a Christian and as a member of the community, it is your duty to stop injustice and violence. And I went, he only had to tell, he only had to tell me once. And that was me. That was, that was it. Anytime I saw something, I, I got involved and I thought, yeah, that's my... Well, I have to admit, remember when I told that story, I did watch the guy getting beaten up. It was it was when they kicked him in the head. I said, I can't go on anymore with yeah, this. Yeah. In my fro I was frozen until that point. And then just instinct was like, you can't do this. Now, I would have to say, we do understand why people don't get involved. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, in Iraq, I mean, you can understand people just saying, if I say or do anything, my whole family's gone. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure people in, in Poland, yeah, there's people feel yeah. help. I yeah. get it. But when we could do something and it wasn't like at the risk of my life or protecting the unborn, you're not risking your life. Mm. Uh, now you may suffer economic martyrdom. The, I, it, it's a, it's a phrase that I've coined. I don't know if you've heard other people use it, but no. this is the martyrdom of the 21st century. It's economic martyrdom. Yes. You'll be canceled. You will, uh, you know, you'll lose your job if you stand as an actor, a teacher, a doctor, yeah. you know, you won't get papers published uh, in scientific journals because, oh, he supports, you know, this church stuff and all. Uh, yeah, we might have some economic martyrdom, but really we, we could get involved. In, and it's interesting. I never told that story before either. Oh, I right. just, yeah. And, uh, and when it came to me, I told you earlier that I had the coronavirus the, the two weeks prior to that homily. So I'm coming right out of the virus. And I was uh, up in some mountains in Arizona where it was snowing. And my niece is a nurse. And she said, uh, Uncle Billy, don't sleep and lie down. If you have coronavirus, walk, you know. And so okay. I was, in fact, I worked every day. I was cutting wood and stuff because we have a fireplace up there in the mountains. It's a mile high. Uh, yeah. And I was walking around in the snow and I was thinking, what am I gonna preach about when I get back to my parish? Cause I'm cut off for them now for two weeks. And then walking in that snow, that, that story just entered my head. I said, yeah, I've never shared that. It's kind of something you shouldn't share at church, but maybe now I'm gonna, and I just said, I'm gonna let it rip. And it turned out, I, I thought it was an appropriate analogy for at what point are we just gonna say, I, I can't just stand here anymore. Yeah. Because no. in America, it's, it's, we're coming up on 50 years of just standing there with, with you know, mm. legal abortion or, yeah. and it's like, and the church seemingly kind of putting it off to the side. Well, we don't want to lose our property. You know, don't want to lose all that money. You know, don't want to lose those donors. Uh, it's like, no, 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 no. But it's, it's time to say it's, I don't understand where the church doesn't understand the words of Jesus. 
If mm. you try to save your life, you'll lose it. Yeah. And why are we so obsessed with saving anything? If we lose it all for the right cause, it's it's well worth it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I saw I saw a report on uh, in Germany that they're stopping the killing of uh, fetus eggs, the chickens, because uh, apparently they can feel it. Um, ah. But they've still legalized abortion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's well. It's- the, this is the, uh, yeah, the pathetic irony that we live in. Mm. We're so obsessed with, like, we must live. The mm. world would be, it would be horrible if I were to die, for gosh <laughs> sake. Uh, meanwhile, the abortion clinics are open during coronavirus, but we need to shut down the economy and yeah. stay away from everybody so that I can live. And it's just, that whole last 14 months was just, it was weird. It was not only weird, it showed the weakness of, of faith. Yeah. That we just didn't say, forget this, man. We're, we, I mean, Jesus is on the cross. I mean, what other image do we need to show people that our belief <laughs> is tied up with that? Yeah. Like we all think like, oh, Jesus died, but I'm going to try to get out of here alive. And it's just, that was all our focus was. I have to survive. But what yeah. about the abortion thing. Well, that's another issue. And a lot of people also think that that's a far issue. I say that there's probably at most two degrees of separation from an abortion for almost every American. Okay. Three degrees at the most. First degree means you participated in one as a woman who had an abortion, a doctor, a nurse who performed it, a boyfriend who paid for it, a dad who drove the girl there. That's first degree of separation. Second degree is I know someone who did that. And I think almost all Americans are second degree. Third degree is I have a friend who knows someone. Mm. But we treat it like it's the hundredth degree out there. You know, bank robbery is about a hundredth degree separation. I mean, I don't know anybody who's had a, you know, robbed a bank. I don't know anyone who's known anyone who's robbed a bank. I don't know anyone who's known. So, I mean, we should rarely talk about bank robbery. (laughs) We're so separated from it. So people are like, why are you always talking about this? I'm like, because we're involved in it. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's around your family. You'll find out. I mean, please, it's in our families, my family, everybody's family, my parishioners. It's, it's, it, it is an issue. But again, because it's unseen, we can bear that issue. But if we were killing kindergartners, you know, which in my mind, I see no difference between mm-hmm. a kindergartner and a three-week-old baby. It's, it's still a human life. Who cares? You know, same thing to me. Yeah. You can hide it. So, man, as 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 a father, and you know, I have, I have a young boy at the moment. Uh, I remember when we knew my wife was pregnant. We got this inso- basically like an encyclopedia out, and we'd read it every week. You know what the progress of the baby, the ears had formed, and all that, and the joy that I had when I knew I had a healthy baby in my wife's womb, and uh, and I was you know on my knees thanking God for for the blessing. The thought of I don't even want to say it, but going that other direction is just, I, I can't describe it. it. It is murder. Yeah. There's no other, there's no other words. Yeah, to it. Heard it up though. And yeah. And so that's why it just, it hurts as a priest. I'm trying, you know, I'm doing this because Jesus asked me to do it. I, mm-hmm. I, my vocation story is basically, I heard Jesus say, follow me. Yeah. And I never wanted to be a priest. Uh, I was never an altar boy. Okay. I went to church because I said, logically, yes, this makes sense. Though I didn't understand the church until I was probably about 30. I didn't know what the Eucharist was until I was 29. I never prayed the rosary till I was 29. Really? And a lady in London who I met in, uh, in Yugoslavia taught me how to pray the rosary. Wow. I said, I know the Hail Mary and the Our Father. I don't know how this works. She gave me this little book about this size or so. And, uh, but I'd never wanted to be a priest. You know, what's interesting though, is I did get a phone call from this lady in London who called my secretary and said, I saw this video of a priest. I believe I met him back in 1993 in Croatia. No. And I said, instantly, it came to my mind, the name of the woman. Wow. And she yeah, that's the name. And so I emailed the lady. I said, you're the lady who taught me the rosary back in 93. I wasn't a priest. I was, I was working for the U.S. government State Department in Hungary in a program called the Peace Corps and 
traveling around Eastern Europe and stuff. Isn't that amazing? That's so unbelievable. And this lady's like, you're the one who I taught the rosary to. I'm like, and then I went looking and I found the little book she gave me on how to pray the you rosary. Oh, wow. But I never wanted to, you know, to be a priest. And so when I did, I said, fine, Jesus. All right, you're calling me. In fact, I joke around a bit. Like even in seminary, I used to say, I don't want to be a priest. I'm doing it because he asked me to do it. And I'd be a fool to, to not drop my net. I'm not going to regret this. But if he says, I don't need you, I'd say, okay, fine, great. <laughs> I'm back to fishing. <laughs> but uh, that just was my approach. It's like, as simple as that. And so now you put your life into it and you're trying to do something to keep a link in a chain of the faith going. And then you feel like, you know, all I got to do, everything I do, and then the president says something else and all my work is kind of like burned up, you know, or the bishop, you know, doesn't back up the church teaching. I'm like, well, what is the point of me doing this? Yeah. You know, of course, I'm going to continue because the people are so good that you say, yeah, there's enough good people that, that need the strengthening. And I, I understand they already believe though. They don't need me so much, but they just need to know I'm there. Just like we need to know that our bishops are there. Yeah. I used an analogy with someone about, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the invasion of Normandy, June 6, 1944. Yeah. So well, Australians were in that, Canadians, you know, some yeah. Irish, Americans, Polish. And it really was a slaughterhouse. Mm. I don't know how the Allied forces won the day there. Yeah. Because the U.S. Navy was supposed to pepper those hills and soften the Nazi targets mm. up until those landing craft hit. But because of fog, I believe two hours earlier, they stopped firing. Yes. Well, that gave the Nazis time to crawl out, recalibrate, get set, and then slaughterhouse. And so, okay, probably not the greatest analogy, but a lot of us priests sort of feel like we're on the beach, Omaha Beach. We're getting nailed, man. But we're like, I'm going to run to those cliffs and I'm going to go into those pillboxes. I'm going to do my duty. But man, I would like to hear those Navy guns go off every now and then. Yeah. Please. Or an airplane come by. You always see those war movies. You know, they're losing the battle and then a plane comes by and they scream, it's one of ours. And you're like, whoo, okay, it's just one plane. Mm. But that's what we need our bishops for. We just need them. Come on, guys. We'll fight the hand-to-hand -hand combat of the spiritual battle with the people, but we need to hear your big guns going off. And that's what we're hoping right now with the American bishops. I think today they're Is meeting their semi-annual meeting. And one of the big topics, the one in the press is, what are they going to say about pro-abortion politician, Catholic politicians? Because you know? the, the question is whether they will give them communion. Is that correct? Or just generally? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the extreme would be, do we excommunicate them? They're not going to get into that because yeah. that's each bishop's purview. The other is, is are we going to tell them, yeah, we will, we're going to tell our priests not to give you communion. The easiest thing is to say is please don't present yourself for communion. Of course, you're welcome to church. And that is a positive thing about President Joe Biden, first president in absolute decades who actually goes to church at least once a month, maybe every other week, maybe every week. Hmm. He should be able to be, he's, he's able to be converted. Do you realize that if he were to convert, he would become sainted. He would be Saint Joe Biden. If he were to say, I repent and I'm the top dog, man, can you imagine that? Yeah. The potential that he has to not only save his soul, but to absolutely uh, change the, the moral climate in this country and in the world. It would be phenomenal. You handed that opportunity and you turned it down. I mean, oof. Kind of like me with the priesthood. When I felt God calling me, I said, I can't turn down that offer. I mean, yeah. I may not want to do it, but I can't turn down the offer. You're God, you know. That just gave me chills. The the, the thought of Joe Biden, Joe Biden uh, repenting, and man, that would be it's happened. Absolutely. I mean, we've had saints who have reformed their lives and stuff, and they shocked the world. I mean, he's yeah. right at that point where he could say, you know what? I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. There's no higher way up, and just reverse himself on everything. Yeah, well, that'd be. He would. Be, he would they would. He would. He possibly could be canonized. We got, we got, we'll keep praying for that. That's for sure. Well, conversion stories are the greatest. You mm. know. Yeah. I mean, one conversion story, you know, blows anything I can say out of the water, as far as you know, moral stuff. You get somebody, you know, a prostitute who converts. You know, a woman who's had an abortion who converts. These are the stories, mm. because that's the that's the gospel. Absolutely. Quickly, I'd love to, because I've spoken to a lot of young 
uh, deacons out here in, in Sydney who are looking at becoming priests. I'd love to, if you could speak to them real quick. I'm really interested to hear about how you said that you never wanted to be a priest. Right. Up until 30 years old. So what actually happened for you to go? Well, first of all, I had a, I'm what, I'm a, I'm a revert. So in my late twenties did what a lot of 20 year olds do. Now they tend to do it a lot earlier, but drifted from the faith, yep. drifted because of ignorance. When I was being challenged about the faith, I really had no answers. I said, if you can't answer your faith, you couldn't say you believe it. So right. then I said, I got to figure out what I believe. And I went on a quest. And most of this took place while I was living in Eastern Europe. I got involved in a lot of different uh, expressions of Christianity, found very good people, but also found some stuff that I just, anyway, had a kind of a mystical encounter one night in a church uh, that changed my life. And I went in there to keep warm and heard God's voice. <laughs> And it was, and it was just, I felt God saying, this is my church and this is your home. That's it, just period. To me, God speaks very subject, predicate, direct object. That's it. If you can't get it, he doesn't need to speak more. And I just was like, yes, this is, this is your church. He's saying, this is it. It may be flawed. You may be upset with it. There's, you know, hypocrites in it and stuff, but this is my church and it's your home. And from that point on, I said, I got to educate myself. And I just started reading anything I could. Uh, and then when I came back to the US, I was involved in youth ministry. Uh, and I started seeing some things at church where I was like, boy, we need better leaders. You know, come on, come on. And then that finger came at me and I felt God saying, and you, what about you? You're 30 years old. You're not married yet. You know, why not you? And I was like, come on, God, you know why I'm not married. You know, all my girlfriends dump me. And he's like, no think about it and i said and i just really felt follow me i said all right wow. and i signed up i got accepted fast and i was not well educated in seminary in other words i went through it in four years it usually takes like 12 so <laughs> i just had to get out there i told the vocation director in phoenix let me add him yeah. it was great he said you're ready to go we just got to get you a master's degree that's awesome that's beautiful but as far as, you know, because uh, I have a gentleman studying to be a deacon too, uh, I think we have to be practical and understand uh, the, the great leaving has begun. Mm. There's not a great apostasy. People aren't saying, I do not believe in the Trinity. Uh, I reject this. It's just a leaving. The Catholic Church is like, like kids grew up with their parents like going bowling. Now that they're 18, I don't really bowl anymore. I just want to go swimming. Bowling's fine, and maybe I'll bowl with you guys when I visit you occasionally, but I'm not into bowling. Mm. So they don't object to it. They just leave. Mm. So they're entering into a phase in which they're, it, the stats, if you follow the stats, we are going to have a precipitous decline, and we have to accept that. Yeah. And preach into that. And yes. maybe, maybe it is time for us to preach inside for maybe a good 20 years. And what we call evangelism isn't going to be what, you know, we normally think of it like I got to go out there. Obviously, we always are going out there, but our yeah. efforts are who's inside the camp? Yes. You know, are all the horses in the barn here trained? All right. And are they, uh, you know, have we broken all the horses or something? We have some Mustangs inside here and wild Broncos. Come on. We got to take care of what's in the barn here before we can get on and go out. So they have to be ready to to reform. And I mean, almost everything, mm. not that it's wrong, but it needs reform. Even the paperwork yeah. that we do needs to be reformed. The way we baptize needs to be reformed, but not in the sense that we don't baptize. It's like, what is the process by which we do this? Mm. Mm. Uh, oh, I've got my list. I mean, and I try to do what I can at my parish and just say, there's nothing wrong with baptizing, you know, a, a four-year-old baby, but why didn't I do, why, why aren't we baptizing after four weeks? Hmm. Should there be, you know, we need to reform this idea of like, don't our people naturally understand that if we baptize babies, we do it as soon as we can. The babies get their shots for measles, mumps, polio. Okay, their bodies are taken care of, but you wait till they're six to baptize. Okay, clearly inside the camp, we don't get it. Yeah, yeah. 
And then you bring about big issues like what I preached about. Well, abortion, well, you know, that's a choice. You know, I wouldn't do it. It's like, uh-uh. <laughs> we need to clean up inside here. <laughs> so, Well, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that because I was on a panel once and we were interviewing my uncle, the Archbishop, and he was saying, I hear that boy. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> it's Is that your boy? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's morning in Australia. Good eye, mate. Hello, little one. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. It's like church on Sunday. Sorry? It sounds like church on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Screaming baby. You know, they say it means the church is alive. Okay. <laughs> No, sorry, I was on a panel with, uh, and, you know, we were all interviewing my uncle, the Archbishop, and one of the questions came through from someone, and, and uh, that fellow said, uh, you know, Archbishop, what do we do now? It feels like everyone's leaving the church, and, you know, how do we get these people back in and all that? And his actual response was almost identical to what you just said. He just said, well, we, it's not about trying to find people, bring them into church. You know, we've got to stop thinking about recruiting and, and that going down that line. We've got to take care of what we have. At the moment, he said, because that's what will actually bring more people in. Because he said, I guarantee you that there's a lot of people who are in church who are just there going through the motions that are actually not, uh, that have forgotten why they're at, the, at church and we're not taking care of what we have. And right. like, Good sign that they're there, but it may not mean what we think it means. Yeah. You know, but it is good, better than them on the couch at home on Sunday, but yeah. doesn't mean that they're completely on board here. Mm. And so, that's similar to something someone said about how do we like get the Protestants to come home? Yeah. And the answer was, you know, the church has the East and the West, you know, Orthodox and Catholic. And those are like the parents and the Protestants would be like the, uh, the children. Well, the children aren't going to come home till mom and dad stop fighting. Yeah. And I, I know that was dear to the heart of John Paul II, you know, whose picture is behind me here. Uh, forgiving Ali Agaka, the guy who shot him. I don't know if you can see that up there. Oh, yes, yes. That was the one thing I asked my parents when I became uh, a priest. They said, uh, what do you want for your priest, you know, as a priest? I said, give me a picture of Pope John Paul II forgiving Ali Agaka. And I said, that blew me away when I was a kid. Oh, beautiful. I, I said, why would someone forgive someone who tried to kill him? But John Paul II is very dear to his heart, you know, to, to move with the East and say, we still have to heal that wound before we, you know, children don't want to come home to parents who are fighting. And so again, there's always that inner uh, work that needs to be done. And now I think it is the focus of the church. It needs to be the focus. And it's not saying, you know, hey, we're just going to take care of ourselves. We're not saying that, but we do have to take care of ourselves. That's undeniable. And I think that's what the American bishops are, are meeting about this week in America. You know, if we deny communion to someone, uh, it's because we're trying to assure people of what it is we believe. We're not here to punish you or as one bishop said, to weaponize the Eucharist. It's like, no, come on. We're trying to make it very clear to people what this house believes in. You want to go to another house? You got a free will. But this house does it this way. All right, dinner's at six o'clock. You show up at nine. Mom doesn't have food for you. Okay, your choice. Amen to that. Um, quickly, uh, what's happening with Father Altman? We well, haven't been keeping up with news. Is he? Is he well, as people know, he's, he's probably the most famous priest in America now. Yeah. Uh, that one homily that he put out filled the vacuum of, wait a minute, okay, World War III, a pandemic, whatever it is, what is the church? What do we have to say? Yes. All that we heard was wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your bathrooms, stay 50 feet apart, only 12%. It's like, hey, I got the CDC for that, okay? We, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor, okay? I never put up a sign that said wear a mask, okay? I believe in free choice. You want to wear a mask? You go into church and you see 10,000 people in there. You have the right to turn around and say, I'm not going in there, okay? Use your head. But that's all we were getting, it seemed. Be careful of this. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's like, what about the gospel? What do we have to say? And Father Altman filled that vacuum. And a lot of people rushed to him to say, this is a voice that is telling us we have to continue to preach in spite of this. Uh, and evidently, uh, you know, stepped on some toes and he's a little abrasive in some ways. But listen, uh, 
it's sort of like a situation had been created, like a messy room, all right? Because the dad you know, didn't clean his room, it, it's, it's a mess. So it's kind of like Father Altman comes along as a maid or something, or you know, a janitor, he's cleaning it up. And he's saying, I wouldn't have to do this if you guys had cleaned this up. Well, now he's really- uh, uh, <laughs> On the chopping block. It, probably. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, you know, like, like, look, I haven't done too many interviews. I mean, I said my thing. It's almost a mic drop moment. I think people get what I'm saying. I yeah. got to take care of my people. Yes. So I'm not going to, half of the priests completely agree with everything Father Altman says. Yeah. But of the half of us, we might not say it the way he does or mm -hmm. go about it that way. But that doesn't mean that he should be dismissed. Mm -hmm. There's still the topic. But you know, this is the problem. Like sometimes a certain issue is like a backpack someone's wearing. If you can get rid of the guy, throw him off the cliff of the Grand Canyon, you also get rid of the backpack. But the backpack is legitimate. It has some arguments. It has some things that need to be talked about and opened up. Mm. So we always hope whenever a, a, a priest or a clergyman or any lay Catholic really attracts attention that he doesn't get thrown off or, or walk himself off the cliff. Yes. Because then it's like we lost all the things in his backpack that needed to be distributed. Yeah. Well, definitely, yeah, he is, uh, he's well supported by a lot of people. And then I think higher up some people don't like the way he's saying what he's saying. I hear you. Father Costco, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I, I do have one question for you, though, before we let you go. And yeah. that is, what is your advice to just the general Catholics in terms of what, what can we do about this movement for pro-abortion and how do we do our part? So the analogy that you use, you use it's snowing. You know, yeah. what, what can we actually do? Well, everybody's encounter with uh, any particular issue is in some way unique. Uh, I think we just can't back down. Yeah. You never want to sit there and say, well, yeah, we just have to just, and we don't have to be in people's faces. We just have to say, I'm sorry, it's a human life. And I'm not going to in any way play with that. Uh, how we can get people to fill in a bubble on a ballot properly <laughs> is quite a challenge yeah. because it's like, folks, all you gotta do is take that pen and fill in this bubble or fill in the one that says write in or cross them all out and walk away. Please don't participate in this. Mm. Don't back down. And when it comes to certain things, like the laws, if you have any influence over them, you don't want to be part of anything that's going to advance the killing of the unborn. Mm. Uh, so we just, just, we just don't back down, but we don't want to be so abrasive that people are, you're actually going to build up the other side. You know, when you're yeah. rude to someone, they're rude back. So we just keep going, keep hammering. We're waiting for other voices to pop up. Maybe athletes, uh, movie stars, corporate heads who just say, we're not playing with this anymore, and especially with the gender issue too. Just yeah. saying, hey, we're not, we, don't, we don't do that at our soda company. I'm not doing that. No, just we make soda, you know, and we don't do this stuff and uh, sue me, you mm -hmm. know. I'm not getting involved with, you know, apologizing for my faith or for why I don't allow you to, you know, advance your agenda on company time. Yeah. We need people with just a little backbone to just say, I'm not backing down from this. Good. And if I lose my company, if I lose my job, there's economic martyrdom. Hey, you got, you know, people think judgment is just God going through the list of bad things you did. I'm absolutely convinced that the moment we all die, the first thing that goes through our mind is I could have done more. And so it's those sins of omission that are the ones that are going to haunt us. Yeah. And when it's like, all you had to do was do this. We weren't asking you to change the world. Just don't vote for a pro-abortion person, for example. Let alone if he's Catholic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I don't know, just because I don't have a, you know, a, a, a design or a, a game plan for this. It's just, hey, you know, if you play football or I don't know, what do you guys play? You know, Australian rules football. Yeah. I mean, do your job. You know what the job is. You wouldn't be on the team if you didn't know you had to hit this guy or block this guy or throw the ball. 
just do it. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're losing 45 to nothing. Okay. All right. There's still just play the game. Will you? Yeah. yeah it it seems so many people are walking off the field and just saying, ah, oh, we're not going to win this one or that's ah, more important that I walk away without a broken nose. And it's like, no, it would be better to have a broken nose in a losing championship. Yeah, man. If you say you're on the team. <laughs> yes, exactly. If you're not on the team and you're in the stands, then yeah, don't leave the game with a broken nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we say when we say we believe in one God and one holy Catholic apostolic church, you just said you're on the team. So whatever your role is. So, no. so I know that's not some super great thing, but I just would no, tell no. people don't back down and keep watching pray. We are in a momentous time. Yes. Things are happening. Absolutely. absolutely. Keeping the goods are kind of being laid out and separated. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Father Cosco, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for agreeing to do this interview uh, with us. It's, it's, uh, it's a real You may be the absolute last one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and uh, just quickly, um, is the church completed or are you still building the church in Phoenix? We, uh, no, we have not built the actual church. I have a hall, a small chapel, and an office building where I'm speaking to you now. And uh, we're uh, we're about two weeks from being completely out of debt, and we're going to start moving ahead. Construction's going crazy in the United States. Every unbelievable, but uh, and there's a lot of work around our area that the city's doing, which actually feeds into us. So we're right. playing a very patient. Uh, it may be 2025, so I will have put in 19 years of my life to complete this project, but I truly am trying to build a church that is unique based on my observations of where the church needs to be today as far as architecture. I have a lot of ideas on it, and I want to see if I can get them in there. They're going to be expensive, Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's a few things that I really want to show people, like this is what a Catholic church of the 21st century should be like, traditional, and yet it has some interesting functional unique things to it that's great we can't wait to see it whatever the lord wills and hey i'm not going to be judged on whether i built a church or not so if it never happens <laughs> I, hey but it would be malpractice for me or whatever negligent for me not to try to advance this parish because hopefully in 20 years there'll still be catholics here in buckeye <laughs> definitely will again super. thanks so much for your time it's been a yeah, love it. super Cheers, or what do you guys say when you say goodbye? Cheers. Cheers. Good night, yeah. Mike. Cheers, Mike. <laughs>